This episode of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast is brought to you by M.G. Schlachter, a built environment and architectural consulting firm with an in-house production team. Delivering support services in the retail, hospitality, and residential sectors for leading brands worldwide, M.G. Schlachter is reinventing, something near and dear to my heart, of course, architectural support services. So look, let's say you're a worldwide fashion retailer and your new business plan calls for opening 450 new stores around the world this year. Or say you're an architecture firm and in order to grow, you need to staff up quickly to produce detailed drawing packages for your new winning project. Or dig this, let's say you're a national hospitality brand who's putting together a new line of boutique hotels and you've got to produce a massive amount of graphics, such as custom artwork, posters, or slide decks, both in digital and print. M.G. Schlachter serves architecture and interior design firms, retailers, construction companies, graphic designers, and brand managers. And with the way they're reinventing architectural support services, they offer production and strategic consulting. Their in-house production team understands the importance of accuracy and precision and can demonstrate the utmost care throughout the drawing and delivery process. And on the consulting side, their team consists of architects and international design consultants with many years of experience in design and construction. Suffice it to say that whatever built environment or architectural project you're working on, M.G. Schlachter can step in and help accelerate your growth. So, if you're looking for a built environment and architectural services firm with an in-house production team to help you reinvent your next project, check out M.G. Schlachter. Find them on the web at mgschlachter.com. That's M-G-S-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R.com, mgschlachter.com. Hey, Revolutionaries, I'm not just excited to bring you this week's episode with Anton Crayley. I'm psyched. I'm pumped. I'm jazzed. Yeah, because, uh, you know, Anton and the, the community he's created with Dropship Lifestyle was an early uh, influence on me in terms of getting to the online world, the digital world, and really what ended up leading to me starting the podcast. So I'm forever grateful for, to him and the group he created for the inspiration and, and the education, really. <laughs> Um, so I'm really excited to bring this episode with him where we're talking about e-commerce lifestyle and drop shipping and, and how we met, first met Johnny FD in Chiang Mai back in 2012. Yeah, that's a, that's a good story. So uh, make sure you listen to the, to the full episode. But before we get to the episode, just real quick, I'm um, down in Orlando this week. So Podcast Movement is just about to kick off tomorrow. I got to run and grab my batch today and uh, help Audimute uh, set up their booth. So it's their first time, tar- first time being at any trade show, uh, let alone podcast trade show. So I'm excited for them. I know the podcast people are gonna um, discover them and really uh, be interested in what they're doing with uh, sound management and those types of things for studios and for, for recording. It's gonna be a busy week, and I'm really uh, looking forward to uh, seeing some podcast friends I haven't seen in a while and uh, meeting some new ones, of course. And uh, hopefully, I'll get a chance to uh, you know post a few things and maybe. Jump on uh, Facebook Live a little bit uh, from the podcast Facebook page. Um, so if you're not uh, watching or you haven't liked that, maybe you want to go to Facebook. I think it's just facebook.com forward slash Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution Podcast. Um, check that page out. I'll probably do some uh, Facebook Lives from there. Just showing you what's going on with the show and showing you some of the new panels. So I haven't seen this yet. I'm really looking forward to seeing my show artwork on an Audimute absorption panel. So Audimute, you know, they can print any uh, image, any custom image on any of their absorption panels. And it's really cool. And so they've, they've printed up some examples uh, using some, uh, you know, podcast shows that are out there already uh, just to kind of generate some interest and show people, you know, their capabilities and such. So I've only seen pictures of it. So I'm really excited to see it with my own eyes. Anyways, I really need to get moving here. So let's get to this week's episode with Anton Crayley. Welcome to Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast, the show that explores reinvention in the digital age as it relates to career, creativity, and technology. Stay tuned for interviews with professionals, entrepreneurs, and creatives that have reimagined success and are making a pivot. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalog, visit Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution.com for instant access. And now, here's your host, Jim Jim. Um, hey, everybody. Hey, this is Jim Jim, and welcome to episode 56 of Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And I'm talking today with Anton Crayley, and we're talking e-commerce lifestyle. So, Anton, welcome to the revolution. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Happy to be here. 
Uh, hey, well, really, thanks for um, jumping on here today with me. And, uh, you know, since I started the podcast, which has been, gosh, I guess a little bit over two years ago now, um, really one of the reasons why I, I pivoted into, the doing, into doing the podcast was because I started with e-commerce, and this goes back, gosh, to I think 2016, almost about two and a half, three years ago now, uh, when I thought, hey, you know what, maybe I want to start exploring some more online stuff or digital stuff, and uh, I came across Dropship Lifestyle, which is one of the businesses that you're running, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, got me got me thinking, okay, like, hey, maybe I should look into this stuff. Anyways, it, it kind of brought me back to 2016 when I started started with DSL. I thought, you know, let me get a little crazy, try some experiment with some things online, and it got me motivated to go to uh, one of the retreats you were having. So that was a first time I think we encountered each other was back in 2016 in Hawaii um, at that yep. retreat. And so, so just in preparing, thinking about, I was going to talk to you this afternoon. It kind of got me remembering those those days back in 2016. But also, most recently in 2017, it was the last time I uh, I saw you because I was at the retreat in Playa del Carmen, and it <laughs> it got me like uh, chuckling, laughing at myself because I remember being down there. I don't know if you remember this story or heard this story back then. So we were staying at this nice resort. It was kind of out by itself. Like I can't remember the name of the resort. Super super nice wherever you had it. And I was on the third or fourth floor in the hotel, and I went out on my balcony early in the morning. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you remember this, but I got locked I do. out. <laughs> I got locked yeah. out on the balcony. And, and I didn't know there's all these monkeys down there. And the balcony just happened to be right on the edge of, um, it was right at the right height where it was at the top of the trees. And so all these monkeys were like coming at me because they were curious or whatever. And I was like, and I think when I walked out there, I think, you know, maybe I'll better, better close the door behind me. Cause I know the monkeys are out there. They might want to like come in my room or something. And I had no idea that it was the door was going to lock behind me. So I was out there for almost an hour. Cause I was up early. It was like six 30 in the morning and no surrounded one was surrounded by monkeys. Yeah. yeah surrounded <laughs> by monkeys. It, oh, in my underwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was like, Oh man, if I don't get down from here, I'm going to have to go to the bathroom at some point. <laughs> um, I, this is going to be like super embarrassing and weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, and like you said, it's kind of secluded too. Some of the rooms you can't, it's not even like people are just walking by every five minutes, especially not at 6am. You're, uh, you're just out there. I was just out there yeah. by myself. I thought I'm going to have to wait like two and a half hours till anyone wakes up and walks by. Yeah. It was really yep. like unnerving. And I'm thinking like, maybe I could jump down. No, I'll probably break my oh. wrist. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, it was just, <laughs> just reminded me because, because you know what, when I, when I first discovered the monkeys, I actually brought my horn with me. And I was out there, I thought, you know what, I got to get some practice time in because I was, you know, being on the road and stuff. I always bring my horn. And mm-hmm. I had no idea there were monkeys down there. And the, the first time I encountered him was I, I went out there on the porch to, or on the balcony to, you know, play a little bit. And like after just like 30 seconds, I, I just you heard all these rushes of the monkeys like shooting right at me, like right at eye level because they were like very curious to hear like, what is that thing we've never heard before? You know, the saxophone. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, it was wild, wild times. But uh, all right, it's a long-winded uh, story. But I wa- the reason I wanted to bring it up was that, in terms of like experiencing dropship lifestyle or the things that you've been able to create, or thinking about the e-commerce lifestyle in general, I think DSL is one of the most interesting things I've um, experienced. You know, most recently, but probably in my overall business career too. In that it's something that's designed around lifestyle, and I think that's part of. To me, the, the, the reinvention, reinvention revolution that is available to everybody now in terms of um, you know, getting connected, getting connected online, it, it's presenting all these different opportunities for everyone to kind of go after what they want, maybe be a solopreneur or entrepreneur of some sort. Um, so can you describe, first of all, what you know, Dropship Lifestyle is or, or what e-commerce is and how you think about it, you know? Yeah, sure. So Dropship Lifestyle is a, it's an online coaching program. I started that in 2013. And that was after probably the end of 2011, I had sold a network of stores. And I was looking online for like e-commerce communities and other people to connect with that were doing something similar. And I found that there was no good information out there online. So I kind of just started posting. And um, at that point, I had already been in e-commerce since 2007. Yeah, 2007. So, you know, I've been doing it a while already, had experience and thought, if I can't find any good information out there, let me just share kind of how I approach doing things like picking products to sell and doing market research and building websites and getting traffic and hiring virtual assistants. So that's what Dropship Lifestyle is. You know, it's evolved a 
bunch of different times since it originally started back then. Mm -hmm. But what that's what it is. Basically, it's it's our business model that we've been using um, probably since 2009 is when I originally transitioned to the drop shipping. But like you said, you know, the, the whole reinvention thing and different paths that you could take and that are available, uh, kind of the way that for me, e-commerce came about and the way that I started was not part of my plan at all. Back in 2007, when I first got started, it was actually when I was just, just out of college and I was uh, thinking that I was going to be like a traditional, I'm doing air quotes here, like a traditional <laughs> entrepreneur. I was right. going to open offline businesses. I was going to work 100 hours a week. I was going to build them and sell them and build wealth through entrepreneurship, but in the real sense of being you know, a slave to the business. And uh, I got pretty lucky, just like most people that you know stumbled uh, upon this this whole thing did. But, but I, I read a book back then, the Four Hour Work Week, when it first came out. Introduced me to e-commerce. Said, "Hey, you could build a website for twenty nine dollars without being technical, without knowing how to code, which right. was great because I didn't know any of that. <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, I spent a weekend. I built my first online store, and within a few weeks, it was making more money than my first offline business. So I was like, okay, I like this. I don't have to drive anywhere. I could work from my home and I'm making more money than I would if I actually ran this offline business I had that cost me 25 grand to start. I see. Wow. So what year what year was that? Because I think the the four hour work week came out maybe in 2007. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think it came out early 2007. Okay. Uh, 2007, I think it was probably the end of 2007 when I launched my first store. Okay. But um, yeah, it was it was right when that book came out. I remember one of my buddies who like he was kind of like entrepreneurial minded also. Um, he was like, oh, I just got this book. I just saw it, I think at Borders or something. Mm -hmm. He's like, I read it in a day. You got to check this thing out. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. I'll read it. And he just lent me his book and I read it. And I was like, uh, okay, what do I have to lose? You know, let, let me, and it's not an e-commerce book. So just everybody right. knows that there's a chapter, I think on e-commerce that is extremely outdated now. And there's a chapter <laughs> right. on Google AdWords, that same thing is extremely outdated. But that was enough to to introduce me to the fact that Anybody could could do this. So I, I thought, again, what do I have to lose? You know, so I, I built a website and from there just learned through trial and error. Right. So at, at this point, how many how many years were you into this traditional career or career? Like you graduated from college? I graduated in 2006. OK, yep. so, so you weren't that far right along. OK, no, not at all. Not all it right. was very early. So um, my, my plan, like I went to school, I uh, went to college for the experience more than anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to miss that part of life, but sure. I always thought I'd do something entrepreneurial. And uh, just from like working odd jobs throughout high school and college, like I did landscaping, I mm -hmm. sold Christmas trees in the winter, and I just saved money. And I had I had about like 20,000 saved, I borrowed like five more from my parents, and I bought the cheapest business I could find, which by the way, is a bad idea. Nobody should do that. Not a good way to invest money. But yeah, the cheapest <laughs> right. business I could find was <laughs> right. a delivery That's route. Saying for a something, bakery. right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> Lesson learned. Yeah. And I, yeah, I did that for a few months, though. And that's when I read the book, The Four Hour Work Week. And I was like, oh, why don't I try to take this offline business and, and bring it online and sell these things online? So that was my like introduction to, to building e-commerce stores and my first product. I see. So, you know, I think that probably worked in your favor because uh, it was before your, you were in a real track, I would say, or before your mind got kind of trained or trained it under a bigger, larger corporate business sort of mindset. So you're probably like, yeah, you still had you know very little to lose in terms of pivoting mm -hmm. uh, and trying that, which is cool. Um, which you know, I think about my experience where I you know worked in the corporate world. Um, uh, I mean, I ended up quitting my job in 2006. So I you know when I got out of school, I worked for GM and Corning and you know corporate places, and I was in the technology world. So I I did come in contact with the venture capital scene and startups, but that's still kind of a very corporate kind of feeling, you know, way to work, I guess, and. And, and you're right on in terms of like the intensity of like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, work 100 hours a week and then I'll be able to cash out in three years if I work for this certain tech, you know, the right tech company and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was doing some of that, but I got totally frustrated. Um, this is around 2001 for me now, like after the tech bubble burst. I was actually living in Boston in uh, uh, New England and uh, mm. ended up moving back to Ohio after that because I really didn't like Boston it was too you know, sort of aggressive and uptight this is kind of a weird place for me, uh, being from the Midwest originally, I think, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. If you're from the East Coast, maybe it's different. I like New York, actually, but um, anyways, so, but yeah, there was this intensity about it, and it kind of, and when I, because I got laid off, and I had quit another job before, it was like, this was starting to make me think a little bit differently, like, what do I really want? Why do I need to do this or whatever? But I was, I still hadn't quite 
broken free yet until around 2006. I got frustrated again, quit my job, and I was like, man, I got to really start thinking about doing something different. And it's curious, it's right, right around that same time, around 2007. I should have yep. uh, read the 4-Hour work week earlier. I, <laughs> yeah. I, didn't, I didn't read it till like, yeah. gosh, it was probably 20, probably 2016. So it took me a while. So anyway, I've been an independent consultant on my own for a while, about 10 or 12 years. But I was still kind of consulting back to the corporate world. And uh, uh, I guess it's a long-winded way of saying that I think what you've been able to build with you know, the way you look at e-commerce and the trainings that you've built, that you help people really, uh, really help me uh, in particular, kind of open my mind or change my mind or, or look at the world differently, just like the four-hour work week does when you first read it. You know, yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm, that's awesome. I'm happy to hear that. And that, that really is like talking again about you know, the, the paths that we could take and, and choices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in from 2007 to through 2011, I didn't even realize like that there was any education out there online or that there were like any type of meetups or groups. So th that whole, what is it? Four year period yeah. was literally me working on my own with my suppliers, with my traffic providers, with my virtual assistants. And I just, I didn't know anything else was out there. And around that time in 2011, I kind of you know faced the decision of, again, like what path should I take? And I saw like two options. And one of them was to go the route that different huge e-commerce stores have went so like csn stores uh, which is now wayfair was a big one back then and then hayneedle.com which owns like over 200 niche specific stores as well mm -hmm. i saw what they were doing and they instead of what i was doing which is building a couple dozen stores they were building hundreds they were also renting gigantic office buildings where they were employing hundreds of people and i was like okay like that's something i i know i can do like i sure. i feel like I, I have the skills but then thinking to lifestyle design, like, do I want that? And for me, it was just, it was a really e easy decision that I don't want anything to do with being the person responsible for that or in charge of that, or of, you know, being up all night thinking about that many employees. And it just, it wasn't, that's not the path I wanted. So that's when I had sold a, a network of stores. And I also thought, okay, instead of opening 200, 300, 500 stores, let me start sharing this information online. So other people out there like me could get information and actually have a system to follow where if they want to, they can work 30 minutes a day, or if they want to, they can build 300 stores, but, you know, kind of give people that choice because I knew I wasn't going to be the one doing it all myself. I had no desire to. Right, right. Well, well, that's interesting because, you know, I, I don't think we can overstate it enough. Like what, what was going on at those certain period of time in these years? Like, you know, now it's a little bit more obvious that you can kind of do some lifestyle design or this concept of kind of like, you know, not having a brick and mortar building or being more location independent, like the whole digital nomad community kind of has, mm -hmm. has popped up. And, um, but you know, you were, I think probably early on sort of a pioneer in a way of all this thought process, I think, or this thinking, like, how did you, I, what, what was, yeah. what were the inputs that you were getting that you made, made you think, man, this is the way I want to go. And this is what I want to so, start sharing with people. Yeah. So what, what I realized on the e-commerce side of things early on, you know, I started literally selling the cookies and bakery products online <laughs> yeah. and I was processing just tons of orders and I was making great money, but they, we had so many customers and I just thought like, this is my choice, right? Like I, I choose to spend more on Google ads to sell more cookies. I choose to right. get this massive volume of new customers. And then my thought process with that was like, well, you know, wait a minute, I, if I could do this, why can't I just sell more expensive products and mm -hmm. make just as much money, but have a 10th of the customers. So, and I did do that. Then I just started, you know, back then I was doing market research differently, but I was using eBay back then. And I was just trying to find opportunities in more expensive industries. And I found them and I spent another weekend and I built <laughs> another website and I set up another Google ads account. And what I thought could happen happened. I, I can get less customers and I can make more money. So right. like that mindset of, 
I don't want to say like doing as little as possible because that would imply like I don't work hard and I definitely do and I love this stuff. But the thought process of trying to maximize input to get the best output possible. So basically we're trying to build sustainable businesses while making as much as possible with minimum effort. So for me, that means selling products that are expensive. So I call it high ticket products. Mm -hmm. That means not actually trying to get all the tra traffic in the world to our websites, but getting only buyer traffic so like people that are you know credit card in hand comparison shopping trying to pick where they're gonna buy from um, that means I focused on things like conversion optimization more than most people because I wanted to make the most out of the people that were coming to our stores mm -hmm. so I think yeah that was the that was the thought process like if I could work less and make more that's what every decision should be based on and they have been since then right Not to say I haven't made mistakes along the way because I definitely have but that's been the goal <laughs> at least oh yeah well yeah. no doubt well to me, that that just speaks to my, you know, my engineering mind, my technical mind. Like it's efficiency. Like why wouldn't you? Why would you not want to be efficient? That that makes total sense to me. And I that's the thing I really couldn't wrap my head around in the, like in the tech sector, for example, where it's like, why am I working, you know, eighty hours a week and I'm only making like a little bit of money, basically relative to the hours that you put in, you know? And it's like, yeah, I want to yep. make a million dollars an hour if I can. That's just efficient. Right, exactly. Right? Yep, yep, definitely. Yeah, and if and if, then once you know that and like that's your thing that you're working towards, it really does make decisions a lot easier. So whether, you know, it's your business and whatever it is you're, you're doing, if it's hiring people, if it's investing time or money into different areas, it makes it much easier to just say no to a lot of things and put more effort into what you think will provide you with that that benefit. Right, absolutely. Okay, so you, you make that decision that it's like, hey, I'm going to go this way. I'm not going to build hundreds and hundreds of stores, you're going to focus on kind of efficiency, like we said, like, you know, higher margin products, a lower, mm -hmm. uh, less intense sort of customer service, because you don't have as, you know, thousands and thousands of customers now, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but why did you decide like, hey, I'm going to put together this um, training course, this sort of right. membership kind of site sort of approach to things where I think this was still early on in conceptually in doing this. I mean, I, I think you were one of the earlier guys that had this idea of creating this community. How did you, how did yeah, you it, get turned on to that? It, de it definitely, there's, there was other people doing, you know, online education and whatnot, but right. it, like the direction that we took, it definitely was the, the first, but the reason that, I mean, the, the reason I started it, it looks nothing like what it is now. And I never planned on it becoming actual business. Uh, basically what happened is after I had sold a network of related stores, I literally was like, okay, again, this is before I even knew that there were like masterminds and forums and communities. Ex exactly. But, it's, yeah. it's just recent yeah, developments, so, you know? <laughs> right. But, but yeah, I was sitting there like, okay, now instead of working maybe four to eight hours a day, I was working like two hours a day with the stores that I still had. And I was like, let me go online and see if I can find other people that are maybe a step ahead of me that I can, you know, connect with, that I can can learn from that I can maybe get some advice from because I kind of was like you know just I, I didn't know what to do next right, so right. I went to Google I think I typed in e-commerce forum or drop shipping forum or mastermind and I just kept finding one website back then which is warriorforum.com okay um, which still exists but basically what it was like before Facebook took over everything that <laughs> right. was the place yeah like where internet marketers would hang out okay um, with that being said as soon as I when I first found it I was like oh this is awesome there's all these discussions about this marketing thing that I do but pretty quickly as I started to you know read through threads and conversations I realized that especially the e-commerce ones the people had just not really anything valuable to say and it sounds <laughs> bad but yeah the con like it was just it, there was lots of contradictory information it was things that i just knew were inefficient um people like ways people were talking about setting up ad accounts mm -hmm. different directories people were talking about paying to use suppliers I and see. i came at this this is what i think was really helpful for me I had done it first for, again, four years. So looking at it, I it was just clear, like, this is just really bad information. Mm -hmm. I, I think a big problem is if I were to, if I was to find that as my entry point, I probably never would have been successful because I would have seen a bunch of bad information from people passing it off as this is what you need to do. Right. I would have believed it because why not? It's on the internet. And I would have probably built a business with a terrible foundation. So um, again, just by having that, that vision and just knowing it's not correct or bad information, I thought, okay, let me just start posting and responding to people's questions. So again, not thinking this was going to be a business, mm -hmm. literally just filling time. I was answering some questions on that forum. I was starting some discussions 
friends, sharing tips that I thought would benefit that community. And, uh, you know, pretty much right away, people started to reach out to me and said, hey, I saw your post on XYZ. Can I pay you for consulting or coaching? And I had no desire to do that. So I just said no to everybody. And then I kept getting questions. And then I figured, you know what, let me record a series of videos that just go through the same steps that we use in our e-commerce stores. And let me, you know, I put it on like a WordPress site and it was $37. I was like, if you want this, I made a bunch of videos. The quality is terrible, but you know, it's, it's what I do. And you don't have to ask me all these questions. Mm -hmm. And people bought it and people said, this is great. And people kept buying it. And <laughs> then I saw there were some holes that I probably could have explained better. So I added to it. I made another version, um, built the community side of it, which as a, as you know, you know, the community is, is a massive part oh, of massive, a yeah. dropship lifestyle. So yeah, like at the Facebook group and our forum started to build out from there. I saw people kind of had questions about things that I originally hadn't covered in the program. So kept adding to it. Then the big turning point where it went from like, not a business, just something I enjoyed to a business was actually the first ever retreat that we did. Mm -hmm. And that was in, a, in Chiang Mai in 2014. So Chiang Mai, Thailand. And the reason that changed everything is because up until then, all of the interaction I had with members was online. And I when I saw people in person and we had real conversations and they were saying how their lives are changed and how they never thought they'd be there and how they're now, you know, quitting their job and they're staying in Asia and these stories, I was like, whoa, okay, this is more than I thought it was. I thought it was me sharing some tips mm -hmm. and I realized it was actually transforming lives of, of people, of members. So that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to make this something that I'm actually actively trying to get people to find because I want people that need information to get the right information and have, you know, the ability to actually have a good foundation instead of finding something that will lead them nowhere. Right. I see. Well, wow. I mean, that's what an, ama what an amazing story. I'm just trying to absorb it all because like, I, I can see like your real, um, sort of frust frustration in a way where it's like, Hey, I'm trying to find more like-minded people like myself to like mm -hmm. keep learning because you're into you know e-commerce, you're into kind of continually learning and trading you know ideas with people, but it wasn't out there. So you, so you tried to you know find it. You started you know offering value, and then people started finding you. I mean, what a what an interesting, um, I guess looking back on it, you know, like what an interesting way to to develop something like this, develop a real community, and and certainly it is transforming people because I I felt when I first went to the um, I guess retreat in 2016 in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. I I was kind of blown away, honestly. I was I was pretty skeptical. You know, I, I had a traditional career. I'm in the engineering world, corporate world. I know a ton about business and technology already. And mm -hmm. I thought, um, ah, see, commerce stuff. There's a lot of scammy stuff, scammy things online, like weird characters out there and whatever. If you start yeah. actually searching around, right? Um, yep. But I thought, well, let me take a chance. Let me dive in, and you know, this would be a this would be a chance to actually meet some of these people to figure out how real it is, you know. Mm -hmm. And actually, when I when I got there and dropped in, I really saw a lot of things that kind of really blew me away. And this is just three years ago, um, where people were, you know, at that point, like Facebook Live was not a real big deal, uh, but people were doing a lot of YouTube videos and capturing things and podcasting and all this other. Like it really was a lesson in all the new media, how people are getting connected. In addition to the actual business lessons of dropshipping, of e-commerce, it really opened my eyes to like, wow, there's a lot of layers to this whole thing. Just just the real digital marketing techniques, you know, the Google AdWords, like all of this stuff came together mm -hmm. uh, in these retreats and it was just like, <laughs> it really opened my eyes. And I really felt transformed like, this is, there's something amazing going on here. Yeah. Really. And, and that's why, right. Yeah. That's why I love these. That's why I love to meet in person, you know, because yeah. it, it's, I don't know, for me, at least it's, it's different to, to bring that, that normal conversation when you see somebody's name pop, pop up in a Facebook group. Right. And maybe they mm -hmm. say something like, I just launched my first Google campaign and got a sale. You're like, okay, cool. Let me click like, but when you're, right. when you're having a conversation with, you know, four or five people in person and somebody says that and everybody else is like smiling and like, Oh, that's so awesome. You know, it brings together just not just like I don't know how real it is, but it also just motivates everybody. And in the people that are getting results, it motivates them more. Um, people that are just, like you said, popping in to see what this is all about. Right. It motivates them to do other things. And I don't know, I think it's uh, I think it's an important part of business in general, like for any business. You know, obviously online is like where the money is made now. That's where it makes sense to market. Right. But I do think that 
digital companies should try to mix in at least something um, in person because it, it really strengthens the relationships and um, I think builds the community even more. Right. Uh, well, well, for sure. And and you know what? I like the way that you, again, kind of approached this whole thing and designed it as this lifestyle sort of uh, flavor where it's, you know, I've been to tons of different conferences and trade shows in, you know, 16 different industries, you know, just for, for throughout my career. And really, this is one of the few, maybe the only really that's designed specifically like this, where it's sort of like half kind of presentational technical knowledge mm -hmm. and half just hanging out and having a good time. And what that allows is that you really get to know people and hear their stories versus just, well, I'm only going to see you for 45 minutes at a cocktail hour. I better pick, yeah. your, pick your brain right now about your you know specific knowledge where that that kind of keeps people's defenses up in a way or something, you know, right? Yeah. And especially, you know, because I, I, when we first did the retreat, I wasn't big into conferences or anything, but since this has grown, I've been to different events, um, other people's events, and I, I can't take it. Like sitting in a conference room all day, even if you're the most passionate person about whatever the topic at hand is, by, by like sometime after lunch, like you got to just check out mentally. It's hard to stay there. Right. And then after that, if you want to, like you said, actually be networking with people, I mean, your brains are already fried pretty much, but like, <laughs> right. So yeah. That, that, and then that's why what we do, and this is actually our next retreat is going to be in September. We're going to be in Prague. First time going to Europe with uh, the group, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But what we do is, uh, yeah, the mornings we have the presentations, usually two to three of them, depending on length. So just, pr you know, normal conference style presentation where you're learning, you're taking notes, we're doing a Q and a, then we have lunch together. And then, like you said, we get on buses and we go somewhere and do something fun and everybody gets to know each other. So I, I think the reason that that's how it started was because, you know, it was all the way in Asia and I knew how many people were just traveling out also. So of course, if you're coming to Chiang Mai, you want to do the things that people do in Chiang Mai, right? You want to enjoy right. it. You want right. to see it. Yeah, for and sure. then like, yeah, the added benefit was better networking. So um, definitely saw the value in it from that first year and just stuck with it. I see. And and uh, you know what? We didn't. I didn't even ask you about like how you ended up in Asia in the first place. Like what what was the stimulus to brought yeah. you out there? Because again, it was just sort of like early on conceptually. I think uh, even for most people now, I talk, I, t I tell them about you know because I've been traveling more the last three or four years about kind of the digital nomad scene and what's going on and. Mm -hmm. Most just average people like in my local town here look at me like, what are you talking about? It's still not that widely known, but you were kind of driving this where you got this idea to go over there early on, you know, five, six, seven years yep. ago, at least. Yeah, it was uh, it was in 2012 when I uh, when I first went went out there. So um, basically, it was just kind of good timing. I had um, my I had was leasing an apartment at that time and a car, and both the leases expired like within the same week. And I was thinking like, okay, if I'm going to do like an extended trip, this is a good time to do it. Mm -hmm. Don't have anything back at home, so if I go and I like anywhere, I can stay for as long as I want. So I uh, I booked a one way ticket to to Thailand. And my plan was like three weeks, but I left it open because I was like, maybe I'll just hate it and come home in like a week right. and, you know, maybe I'll like it and stay longer. But I figured three weeks and that trip lasted nine months. But uh, <laughs> right. the reason, yeah, the reason <laughs> I chose Asia back then in Thailand was uh, because actually, again, going back to the book, the four hour work week, when that book first came out there for a few years after there was a forum um, on the four on like Tim Ferriss's blog and mm -hmm. it got closed down probably around 2013 but there was an open forum where people were having conversations a lot about lifestyle design and a bunch of people were talking about Southeast Asia and how the cost of living is so good and how you know beautiful it is and how good the food is so I remember just seeing that and being like that's interesting I never would have thought to, to travel there right but this sounds cool so let me go and when I went there I didn't even even know what I was going to do. I remember I showed up in Bangkok, flew into Bangkok, mm -hmm. um, went and stayed at some local hotel, like in the worst part of town, like, you know, the tourist area, but where you can't sleep, it's a party all night. <laughs> and right. I walked up and down the street and there was all the little tours and booths like they have. And I remember I just walked into one and I was like, yeah, I'm here maybe for a couple of weeks. Do you have any kind of, um, you know, trips where I can go see different parts of the country? And the guy gave me a map and he was like, yeah, if you want to do this, you know, we'll take you through this city and this city and this city. 
city and you'll be up in Chiang Mai. And then when he said Chiang Mai, I remember thinking like, oh, one of the people that I used to talk to on the on the forum or one of the names I used to see on the forum, uh, the guy said he was in Chiang Mai. So I ended up reaching out to him. And that's Johnny, who, uh, you know, the okay. biggest person in Chiang oh, Mai. Right. That's okay. like brought everybody out there. Yeah. Right. So I remember I sent him a message. I'm like, hey, I'm on a train. I'm coming up there. Um, you know, if you're in town, let's meet up and get dinner. And uh, yeah, we met up. He ended up telling me, oh, a new co-working space opened called pun space which literally had just opened and i was like there's co-working like in, in the middle of the mountains in thailand and i was like all right let me let me check it out i'll go there right. tomorrow and i went and i saw people from all over the world all different ages i saw people building e-commerce stores people doing affiliate marketing um, people that were programmers like building their own softwares people that were freelancers and i was like this is crazy like this is what I, I've been missing it, it. It almost felt fake. So right. that experience, just meeting all those people made me think, let me, let me stay here because I don't want to just be in town for, for two nights. Like there's something going on. So right. that's where I stayed for, for nine months. Right. Oh, that's amazing. So that's how you met Johnny. I never knew that. That's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was like, I remember it was, it was through that forum and then we were friends on, I guess this was like years later. So I think Either like he must have added me as a friend or something on Facebook, like maybe in, I don't even know, 2010 or something mm -hmm. from that forum. And then I saw his Facebook posts in, in that in that time, 2012, saying I'm in Thailand and, you know, posting photos in Chiang Mai. And I was like, oh, I don't know who this person is, but he's up there and I'm going to be there. <laughs> wow. What a cool discovery. Well, you know, it reminds me a little bit like I had, I had just a small kind of discovery like this in 2016. So like what kind of start maybe really started my reinvention was my my main client had stopped paying me. And, you know, big corporate yeah. client yeah. and, and they owed me like 15, 18 grand. And it was like, you right. know, 30 days late, 60 days late, 90 days late. And I'm like, what is going on here? It was really like, I thought, well, maybe the project's over. Maybe I got to sue these guys. Who knows if I'll, if I'll ever get paid. And I was so pissed. And this is early 2016. So it's like February. And I thought, you know what? I got to blow out of town. And I just happened to have a friend from high school who lives in Bangkok. And, and I thought, you know what? I need to just really reset my mind. And I decided to go traveling for a month. I had never left and had taken a vacation like that, solo vacation, certainly for that long a time ever. And I thought, let me just drop in. And when I got over there, my buddy Ed, he's like, uh, you know, well, you're going to be here for a few weeks. Why don't we go up to Chiang Mai? And I had no idea what Chiang Mai was. I'm like, what are you talking right. about? Right. <laughs> and so he's like, oh, it's cool. It's up. You know, he wanted to get out of Bangkok because it's always super hot in Bangkok. And it's a little bit cooler in Chiang Mai. And so we go up there. And actually, he pointed out, like when I when we were up there, he's like, yeah, I think there's like some bloggers that like to hang out here's travel bloggers. I think he called them, it, yep. you know. And I saw him like, you know, people with their laptops. I'm like, oh, that's that's interesting. Whatever. I didn't really think much of it. And then I get back to the states, and that kind of then that trip really blew my mind because all the people I met there really kind of opened myself up to like, man, I need to travel more. I need to do this more for my just my in general for my life. I get back, I start searching online, uh, and I remember him telling about like people working online in Chiang Mai. So I start searching how to make money online and yep. Chiang Mai just starts coming up, right? Uh, if you do that search out there. And, you know, Johnny's podcast started coming up, Travel Like a Boss. And then yeah, you started yeah. you started coming up because <laughs> it's 2016 by now. So yeah. that's really what Pete's kept reinforcing, like, hmm, maybe there's something to this, right? Because just because I had happened to be, be there physically earlier. Be there, in, yeah. In 2016, yeah. It, you know? It's it's crazy. It is hard to stumble upon. You know, it's it's, it's yeah, so it different. Is. It's not something most people are thinking about. No, know, they're thinking to get into entrepreneurship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's just it's completely bizarre. I mean, I, I tell people now, and they still like I've stopped kind of talking to people about it because it's if their mind's not in the on the right wavelength, I don't know what they think right. of me or or whatever. They just have you know crazy well, ideas in, in their head. You know. I'll tell. Yeah. Like so. You know. After that. I after um after living in Chiang Mai, I lived in Vietnam for almost like three years uh, amongst other places, but I've been back in the States now for like three years, three and a half years. And honestly, like even to me, somebody that lived in Asia for four years, it sounds crazy now because I've been away from it for a while. Mm -hmm. And just to think like, cause the community has grown since I've left. Right. And just to think like what's actually happening. Um, even again, for somebody that lived that life for a long time, it's, it's still like, it gives me goosebumps. Like on the other side of the world, there's meetups almost every day. There's dinners almost every Every night with groups of entrepreneurs from all around the world right. that are building their own things while living in really an amazing location. Right. And I, I just don't think it's happening, you know, here in the in the US in the same way. Maybe because there's more distractions or 
or whatever. Like, you know, sure, it happens in little pockets here and there, but it's just... It's, it's more distractions and it's more expensive. And yeah, people, expensive, they, have right. to, they have to work more. That, that's a big thing. Um, you know, last summer, I, uh, I stayed for like three months in Manhattan and I thought like, okay, this is going to be fun. Like, I, I love New York City to begin with, but I thought not only that, but I'll be able to network with all these other entrepreneurs that are building big things. And what I quickly realized is they're all very busy and people don't right. have, you know, people aren't making much time for coffee and lunch and dinners. Like they, they're, they have to work. So yeah, it's a totally different way of uh, thinking and uh, like approaching life. Right. And honestly, I was more productive out there. Like sometimes it's like, I know personally, I, I, I used to think being around people that were always working on much bigger things and so focused would lead to, you know, maybe me doing the same. Mm -hmm. But I actually got more out of my time in Asia where I would work maybe for a couple hours in the morning, then get lunch with some friends, then work in the afternoon, then go meet up and, you know, smoke a shisha and hang out and just talk with you know five or six people right all these ideas come up that you can implement so totally different way of approaching things but i think it's better yeah i, I think so too and and yeah you, you mentioned something like about kind of just the pace of things i think for me what, what when i first started consulting in 2007 i quit my job i wasn't sure what i was going to do someone just called me kind of out of the blue and that's kind of turned into this consulting gig that's kind of sustained me for the last 10 or 12 years uh but i i purposely scheduled in like I, I was so burnt out that I didn't want to take a job and I only told him I was going to be available like 20 hours a week max because uh, yep. I, I needed to build some space into my life to like really think about what was going to be next or whatever and since I started doing that it's been like 10 or 12 years ago I realized the the value and the power of having that space like you are more productive you you're you have more clarity mm -hmm. and you're you're able to to sit back and be like, if you just tweak this little direction you're going in, maybe half a degree over the next three years, it's going to have a massive impact versus never having the space in your life to even sit down and think about it. <laughs> yep. And that, you know? like what you just said too, that it's a huge problem. Like since you, you know, consulting, you have that ability for people though, that like are trapped in jobs. Right. That, it's crazy that they're not allowed to do that. Like uh, they're I not really allowed, think companies right. should mandatory, you know, maybe tell employees like, listen, two days a month, these are days that you're working, but you're not doing any work. You're not, right. you know, clicking buttons and doing the things that have to get done. Instead, you're reflecting on those past three and a half weeks for where there's opportunity, for where things things could be uh, streamlined for what's next because that's where the ideas come from not when you're just doing what has to get done when you're thinking about why you're doing certain things oh i i totally agree yeah man uh it just gives me chills even thinking about it because this is such a it, once you kind of figure this stuff out for yourself or you or you see it or you get dropped into somewhere randomly like chiang mai and you're like wow this is really going on and and you can see how fruitful it is it's pretty pretty interesting to think about well you know that makes me think about now that you just you just moved to north carolina right I did. Yep. Yeah. About a, about a month ago. Yeah. Physically where you're living, whatever, what, what's drawn you out there and how are you thinking about being in North Carolina? I know you're a little more, more settled down now because you're married and you, I think you have family now. Um, yep, yep. I mean, yeah. So originally I, I was, I, we moved back about three, three and a half years ago, but went to, uh, to Austin, Texas, uh, for the first, you know, three, three plus years. Mm -hmm. And, um, the reason came back is because when I was living in Vietnam, in Saigon, basically we were growing as a company and I was hiring more people and I was hiring a lot of people from the States mm -hmm. and, uh, they were moving out to Asia and I literally rented a coffee shop out there that had went out of business and we made that our office okay. and none of it was legal. So I had <laughs> right. you know, US employees, <laughs> I had an office space for all of us and I was like, this isn't a way to grow, you know, not if not if we really want to grow. So um, I thought, okay, let me give it a few years. We'll come back to the States, chose Austin because had some friends out there. Um, to be honest, it wasn't my favorite place in the world. I definitely not somewhere I saw myself long term. Mm -hmm. um, while I was living there, though, we we did have a baby. I got an 18 month old son now. So I'm um, thinking, OK, like, what's next? Where do we want to go? And decided on North Carolina because I am from the East Coast, from New York. I actually had lived in North Carolina for a couple of years prior to Asia because the weather is better than New York and mm -hmm. I can golf all year. And I also have some family here and just helps with the, the baby. So sure. that was really the decision to come this direction. Um, I love the weather. I really like the scenery. I like that I could drive a couple hours to the beach or in the mountains. And uh, yeah, it just seems like a good quality of life for what I'm looking for right now. Also, the Charlotte airport is is pretty legit. There's like direct flights all over Europe, and it's a uh, it's an easy place to travel from. Right, right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, Austin's kind of interesting. I mean, I 
that's one of the places that kind of pop, popped up on my radar screen in terms of like technology, for example. There's like, you know, the three yep. sort of technology cities or, you know, or areas are, you know, Boston, East Coast, Austin, Texas, and Silicon Valley, of course. Yep. Uh, but I, I never really, um, really, I guess, really wanted to live in either of those places. Right. <laughs> you know, I've traveled there a bunch and like I've thought about it over the years, but like now, now, that, now that I'm where, where I'm at now, where I can kind of like manage my lifestyle better. I like being in uh, Northeast Ohio here where I am, like during the summers. And then now I just travel more during the winters when the, you know, when it gets cold, I, I can go to Asia or wherever. But yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah I, I was curious why you ended up in North Carolina because I knew you were only in Austin for a short time. I thought maybe you're getting ready to go back overseas or something. Like maybe you miss, you know, being in Asia or something. Yeah, you know, we're doing uh, with like an extended trip over there um, in the winter now because my wife is Vietnamese. So we went back last year for I think about a month. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the her family and everybody could hang out with the baby. So we're going to do the same probably pretty much every year. There'll be at least one month that I'll be in Asia, which I love, obviously, because get to connect with everybody and enjoy that side of the world. Um, and then, yeah, still still plenty of traveling. Like one of the things with Austin was the summers there are just so disgustingly hot. Right. That's why, like last summer, I mentioned we in Manhattan, which is hot in the summer too, but nowhere near Austin. So mm -hmm. yeah, we do, do kind of the same, you know, pick the place that I think you feel most comfortable for most of the year. And then when, you know, you want to go, it's not hard when you, uh, when you control where you work from. Yeah, exactly. So, well, thinking about that, um, what else do you have going on in terms of like, you know, you do DSL, that's a big part of what you're doing, but mm -hmm. I know you had some other uh, companies out there or endeavors that you were doing like performance marketing or other e-commerce things. Yep. Um, are those still around? Or are you still concentrating on those? Or what are your thoughts in that regard these days? Yeah. So besides the, we, we do have the e-commerce side of the business that actually is scaling right now. So that's something we're growing. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know what, let's, we should do another podcast in like six months and I'll tell you like the next stage of e-commerce and what we're working on because oh, now it's still that. very early on. Okay. But yeah. It'd be cool to do an update. I'll let you know how things are going. But um, yeah, we're putting a lot of our, our team's effort and focus into the, the e-commerce side of things. Um, I do have a, a podcast now called e-commerce lifestyle and performance marketer. That was the brand where we were sharing. I don't maybe more stuff that would apply to like info and software marketing mm -hmm. as well as e-commerce. Um, we put some effort into that for a couple of years and then stopped and you know, Basically, what happened is we looked at team output and effort into each project. We looked at how things were growing and what things were doing better and what things weren't and kind of too much, too much effort for too little results. Gotcha. So that was, uh, yeah, that's, that's cut off. And there's a lot of things like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah. you got to keep experimenting. I mean, that's kind of what being an entrepreneur yeah. is about is sort of, uh, you got to get a taste for something, see if it's really going to work or not. Well, well, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm super interested in, in, kind of just seeing what you have going forward. So yeah, maybe we'll get back in touch with you in a few months. That'd be cool to see see what you're doing. I, I am interested a little bit in your podcast. Well, I, I like listening to your podcast, but I know you're using Anchor. Is that right for your podcast distribution system or how you're I, recording i yeah i am and that like the only i i do i love them so far it's been great okay um i mean one it's it's free but the main reason i started using them is because i've thought about doing a podcast for a long time and you know the the, the technical side is just something i never wanted to add in like having an sop for it and someone on my team to edit and upload and cut things right. so the way that i do mine is i either record into the microphone on the computer or typically i'm recording straight into my phone into the anchor app then i click a button and it's pu pushed on to like 10 different platforms for listening so yeah i use them for ease i got you okay yeah so you so you like it i mean it's a little bit i think they've been a little bit controversial in the podcast world in terms of like do you own your content and all these kind of things and if you're like a real creative person trying developing yeah. a show i think for the stuff you're doing i think it's perfect it's the perfect solution really because you're just trying yeah. to share you know a little bit of motivation and tips and and those things are always changing so yeah that's cool i think it's the um i'm, I'm at how did you settle on that do were you did you just have to search a while to figure that out for yourself i think who told me about it Somebody must have recommended it to me because yeah. i remember just being like oh all i have to do is have an app on my phone and then i signed up I downloaded the app and I signed in with my uh, my Gmail address and I clicked record and then I clicked publish and it worked. So yeah, okay, <laughs> I, yeah, I think it was a recommendation. But oh, yeah, I, I think that there are like some things that I don't like about it. Um, when you when you publish podcasts and let's say somebody shares a link directly to the podcast, for, let's say somebody shares an iTunes link mm -hmm. for a podcast episode on Facebook, yeah. the metadata that it pulls in will say, you know, e-commerce lifestyle with Anton Crayley 
a podcast by anchor or something like that. So yeah. you don't have the options to have complete control over that. So I do wish that they had like a premium version that gave you more controls, a paid one, mm-hmm. be more than happy to do that. I know Spotify bought them a couple months ago, so that's right. maybe that's in their plan, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah. That's, you know, that those things are kind of just being worked out. There's some growing pains and stuff in terms of how this, all this stuff is rolling out. So I'm actually going to podcast movement in Orlando coming up here in August. So maybe nice. I'll, I'll find out, talk to people down there about it. So yeah, podcasting things kind of been interesting. Uh, you know, when I first started, you know, got into DSL, I was a building, I was building a store, of course, you know, cause that's what you do. And I was really yep. learned a ton of cool things, but I kind of, uh, uh, there were things, things that happened right when I was about to kind of really start driving traffic to the store that uh, kind of killed my momentum for it. Actually it was, I think it was in 2017 and, uh, my aunt had died. I got pneumonia. It was like around the holidays. It was like a really depressing time of the year. Uh, yeah. this, this is why I'm not doing my store right now. Aniston. sorry. I feel like I'm in confession right yeah. now, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but what happened was I, I, and I'd already booked my a trip to go to Asia, like in mm-hmm. leaving like mid late January. Um, you know, I was already planning for that. And I thought, well, I, I want to keep going cause it's helping me change my mind, my outlook. And, uh, I'll, Either I work on the store while I'm there, or, or when I get back, I'll definitely, you know, buckle down and do it. Right. But during that trip, you know, I was with my buddy hanging out. We went up to Chiang Rai, and we were knocking around all, all over the place. You know, I was uh, kind of thinking about, well, am I going to be happy really running in the store? Is that really what I want to do, or what, do I want to keep learning about technologies, or, or whatever? And I was really getting a lot out of, you know, listening to podcasts and discovering all this stuff and discovering people's stories, which is the mind blowing part of like what's really going on, you know, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll just start a podcast. I was joking around when we were taking pictures up in Chiang Rai. So the, the, actually the album cover of me in front of the clock tower in Chiang Rai in, in Thailand, that's what's on the cover of the, of the podcast. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And that was before, yeah, that was, that was before I had a name or any idea of even starting the podcast. I just thought, oh, let's just take some funny pictures. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll start a podcast someday. Nice. <laughs> and, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> that's exactly what happened. So anyways, uh, cause it's allowing me to keep continue learning the digital marketing side and, and still figuring this stuff out, but also, you know, connecting with people I want to talk to and, and really providing you know value out there for just like the value I was getting and still get from listening to all these things. I mean, it's amazing. So, um, anyways, thinking about technology, got a few more questions before we get out of here. Um, yeah. A few things I like just to you know pick people's minds, brains about in terms of technology and the the way things are moving these days. Since you know you're not really a technologist by heart, you're more of a marketer, business person, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, is there something about how do you think about technology and how things are changing so quickly? Um, and, you know, how you approach it, like, is, you know, is it overwhelming or is it, you know, super fun for you to keep engaging with it? How do you, how do you think about it kind of on a daily basis when things are moving so quickly? Yeah, no, I, I definitely, I enjoy it. And I put a lot of time into studying what's happening and what's on the horizon and what's already available. Um, you know, back like when I first started with e-commerce technology, every single little thing that I would want to have done or implemented to my stores or to my emails or anything was a huge project with developers that cost thousands of dollars. Right. And now it's either somebody for a hundred dollar project or a click of a button and an app installed. So the way that I, I see it kind of two ways. Uh, one way, there's so many new things that are available kind of to, to try or to use that it's overwhelm and I think too many is a bad thing. Like you don't need them all. Right. So you don't want to get into a situation where you're, yeah, where you're doing everything and, and anything when it comes to your e-commerce store. Um, on the other hand, I, I love Shopify, as you know, is hands down my favorite e-commerce platform. Right. And what I love about them is not only like, do they have the best customer service, but they are advancing e-commerce technology it's just light years ahead of everybody else. So like the way that a Shopify store even works now compared to a few years ago mm-hmm. is night and day. You, If you use Shopify payments, which is basically it's, it's a white label of Stripe for pay- payment processing that they use. Now you can accept, uh, you know, Google Pay. You can accept Apple Pay. Your website will recognize if somebody's on your website on an iPhone. And if they're using an iPhone and have Apple Pay, that button will just pop up and they can buy from you. And like, a, I think they did a comparison. It was mm. like five seconds versus a minute of filling out forms. Right. So things like that. Um, they have, you know, built in currency conversions. So where you are in the world, the right currency will show up. But not only that, they have it built in now, like 
you know, in, in Canada, people use primarily different payment methods or a different type of card than in the US, mm -hmm. than in Germany, than in China. So it recognizes that and it shows you the payment options that are most you know relevant based on where you are in the world. So um, I, I love it. Again, these are things that like I would have only dreamed of back in the day. And now they're just popping up every single day. Um, the other thing I'll say about like technology, a big thing that I have seen changing that I like, but might be scary in the long run is how automated advertising is becoming now. Mm -hmm. And this is primarily on Facebook where we used to have at least one person on our team that primarily, that not primarily, they only did Facebook ads. Like that was their role. Facebook ads, breaking them up in our ad accounts by every single demographic you could think of, right. men, women, main cities, mobile, desktop, right hand column, you know, main feed. And we did that because that's what you used to have to do to get the best results. Mm -hmm. And the way it works now is we can basically just say, hey, Facebook, here's a photo of this thing, run it. And they do, and it works. And uh, what's good about it is it's a lot less work, but I think what's gonna happen is more people start to use all of the automation that like platforms like Facebook provide mm -hmm. is that it's just going to level out like costs will rise and you'll kind of be stuck there because they'll have all the data they need. And <laughs> basically, <laughs> right. yeah, like, you know, people that are profitable will be and people that aren't won't be able to, to play the game anymore. So we'll see. That's one thing that scares me about technology, though. It's become as far on the advertising side, it's getting less about skill and more about the AI on Facebook and Google. I was going to say, yes, the data analytics like that that exist now. Right. Because yeah. all, all this stuff is visible to Facebook or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. And they can really just, yeah, throw, throw a lot of data analytics at it and say, this is exactly who you should be targeting instead of you mm -hmm. having to choose. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, yeah, and, and even beyond that, they'll do th if you upload like a 15 second video, mm -hmm. they'll make different versions of it automatically. They'll tr they'll test all different cover photos from it for which one's best. You can give it like five headlines and five descriptions, and it just constantly cycles through them and finds winners almost instantaneously. So totally different than the way it used to be, even wow. just like a year or two ago. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, wow. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. amazing. Well, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to, in terms of just technology stuff, like you said, Shopify, uh, to the augmented reality stuff that's coming. So that that's oh, yeah. super interesting to me because um, I see like the whole in the next two to three years, you know, probably max, you know, everything, every mobile like phone experience is going to be have some augmented reality part to it. You know, when you're just looking through your phone, just like you know. What was it? Po the Pokemon game that came out a few years ago, right, <laughs> or whatever, right. right? Yeah, you know, you I, have I just did it in, in the new home here. I just bought a rug. Oh, and you did. Okay. I went to the, yeah, and I I held my phone up with my living room, and I dragged the rug, and it was on the floor under my couch and my coffee table. And I thought, what what is this? How does this happen? But yeah, it's, yeah, that's reality now. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. uh, well, think about all this stuff, and you know, you you're you've been immersed in this now for a while, and you're you you I would say you're a thought leader in terms of just lifestyle design you know, location independence, e-commerce, those types of things. But, you know, going forward or maybe like on a daily basis, like, you know, I'm curious to see what's going to be coming here, like you said, in six months. How do you keep your mind open to key and continue to trying things or or pivoting it into different niches um, as time moves on? Because I think that's a real skill or something that people really need to th keep thinking about for themselves and keep developing within themselves. How do you do it? Yeah, I think one thing that I'm kind of, I don't know to say lucky, but one thing that, that's good for me that works out is I really do enjoy business. I really do enjoy making websites and I enjoy looking into other companies and trying to figure out what they're doing. And I enjoy testing our ads and I don't have much of a risk tolerance. So like, honestly, if it was up to me, like when I'm working by myself and don't have a team, mm -hmm. I'm willing to basically always like pivot and try something completely new because if it doesn't work, you know, it's a learning experience, but I see, um, I, yeah, it might just be a personality thing where that, that is what I, 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 I enjoy this more than going and sitting on the beach for a day. You know, I'd, I'd rather <laughs> see what, what I can do in our ads to, to two X our results. I see. Well, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And I think it's, like I said, as, as, as I think about the world, like, you know, it's kind of like I was at a kind of a pivotal point in my life a few years ago, I think now that I'm kind of just pivoting, see the world, seeing the world different now, where I was kind of looking ahead thinking like, as, as you see technology moving and see the world moving in these different directions, like, where do I want to be in a few years? You know, do I want to be in the mix of all this stuff? Or do I want to be sort of uh, 
irrelevant in some fashion because I stay in this lane over here that's not moving as fast or whatever. So that's kind of how I mm-hmm. think about why you want to kind of continue to keep keep your mind open and, and tasting and trying different things. And if you continue to do that, I don't think the risk is there. I think people get scared and they think it's risky, but once you start doing it and kind of get over on the other side, break once you break through to the other side, you know? <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, it's not as risky to to, to approach it. So, I, well, no, the I, risk is when you don't do anything. But sorry, go yeah, ahead. exactly. That's, to, that's totally right. Um, yeah. Well, I got one one final question for you. Usually, I ask for uh, I ask people about um, a reinvention revelation, but I'm not going to ask you about that because you're like you're like presenting reinvention reinventions to all of us. Like you're really transforming a lot of people with all the stuff that you do. And so, uh, for you, I wanted to ask. What what do you feel urgent about right now in terms of like the way the world is spinning or maybe just in your personal life in terms of like, man, I really need to learn more about this or I need to take more time to do that? Like, what are you thinking? What's what's urgent for you these days? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, trying to think of anything outside of the ordinary. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it, it changes so much. I'm trying like right now. I I'd probably have, would have said the same thing if you would have asked me like last year or even a year before that. But um, a lot of what I focus on every day is still trying to simplify. Um, you know, even a lot like you mentioned, like performance marketer earlier, mm-hmm. and that was kind of one of many things that we've been doing over the past three or four years. Um, some stuff that's you know public facing, some things that's internal, but like a lot of stuff that we have done and added in and just wasn't necessary and you know, pulled away from, from resources. Mm -hmm. So I would say more than anything, just always asking that question, is this actually helping us move towards the the goal? And if it's not a hundred percent clear that, that it is just getting rid of it. So, um, focus on, on cutting rather than adding. I see. I like that. Well, again, it goes back to kind of having this space to sit back and really consider those things. It kind of helps you just keep clarity and keep focused. Cool. Well, Anton, it was awesome having you on the show. If, if people are interested in, you know, finding uh, D- DSL, Dropship Lifestyle, et cetera, or getting in contact with you, where would you send them or where would you want to get in touch? Yeah, sure. The best place would just be the website, dropshiplifestyle.com. Everything is linked off there. I do like a weekly video and all my contact info is on the contact tab. And if you want to hear me uh, rant by myself for 10 minutes at a time on the podcast, that's <laughs> ecommercelifestyle.com or just search ecommerce lifestyle in any podcast player. Right. I gotcha. Yeah. And I'm sure that, you know, if you search YouTube, et cetera, you, you'll come up there and uh, you're, you're yeah. all over the web, which is, which is great. So, well, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully maybe talk to you in six months and see what's going on. Definitely. Let's do it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Cool. Thank you for listening to Jim Jim's reinvention revolution podcast. If you want to hear more, join our mailing list at Jim Jim's reinvention revolution.com. See you next time, and remember, the revolution has just begun. So dig in, embrace the process of reinvention, and start realizing the success you've always dreamed of. Hey, revolutionaries, if you enjoyed today's episode and today's guest, let them know by commenting on their Facebook page, finding their Twitter handle or Instagram feed, and letting them know you heard them on Jim Jim's Reinvention Revolution podcast. And tell them what you got out of the episode, what you really liked, or how they inspired you. I know they would get a kick out of it and will help others find the same value that you found.